Hey guys, and welcome back to the Mission Makers podcast. During the season break, we're diving back into some of our favorite moments of season two. And this week, we've put together some of the best insights into business by three TED speakers and four phenomenal leaders who guested on the podcast. We start today's episode with insights from Sally Ann de la Casa, a lady whose mission is centered around fostering leaders through the soft skills that make us human. We then hear from Akash and Nikita Mehta, a brother and sister duo who recently launched an incredible plant-based wellness brand, Healing Hair Through Ancient Ayurvedic Beauty Secrets. They've both had really interesting journeys to get to where they are today, from Akash being the youngest ever global digital manager at Dior and a Forbes 30 Under 30, as well as being a musician who's achieved over a million streams on Spotify, to Nikita, who spent her career building luxury fragrances for her family business, who have been involved in designing the scent of Formula One. And lastly, we hear from Shelley Zalis, an internationally renowned entrepreneur, Forbes journalist, and champion of gender equality through her initiative, The Female Quotient. Shelley has connected more than 18,000 women in business who are transforming workplace culture at signature pop-up experiences in the FQ Lounge, which have become an incredible gathering place for leaders at all levels in events such as the World Economic Forum. So it's safe to say we have a very interesting chat ahead, touching on many, many things from the challenges of being a millennial leader, why C-suite leaders value our soft skills more than the hard skills we develop, and changing precedents in unprecedented times. So let's dive straight in. Now, a topic that you're incredibly passionate about um, is human is human skills and soft skills in particular. You've said in the past that if you think of a human in terms of a house, then the hard skills would be the walls, but the space in between the walls is where you find the human skills. I love I love that analogy. So talk to me more about the ideas um, behind this. Sure. So let's, you know, let's think about any, you know, for anyone, your audience or even yourself, any incredible doctor that you know or any incredible human that you know. And if I were to ask you, why are they, why do you think that they stand out? you're not going to tell me uh, because they have a Stanford degree or they have an Oxford degree or, uh, or something relating to some hard, you, you will tell me most of the times, you know, it's the way they make me feel when I'm around them or it's the way that they put creatively ideas together. Like, I don't know where they come up with that. It's always the human side of us that makes us exceptional in our unique combinations. It's the quirkiness, you know, that's the weirdest person I ever met, but I love it, Um, right? So it's always those things. And when you think about any job role today, and the majority of job roles are people facing, right? Where we, we interact with humans, that's where we spend most of our time. We spend most of our time, you know, there's studies, um, uh, Stanford, Harvard, um, and Carnegie Mellon has a study out and even Google through Project Oxygen, you know, 80 to 85% of top performers at Google are not there because of their tech skills. You know, they're there because of their human skills, right? Things like coaching, things like empathy, things like, you know, listening. Um, The same in terms of the study. So most jobs and most roles out there, 85% of the success is is human skills. The reason why we have not really focused on them is that we take it for granted that we all have them. And you know, if I were to say to you, how many not so great communicators do you know? We know a lot of them, right? Or how many people you know that are not creative? We know a lot of people who are not creative, right? We just take it for granted, that's one. And number two, uh, those who are, or if we're teaching those things, we don't know how to measure them. So how do I measure? that you know, Farah is very results oriented. It's really good with self-direction. Or how do I measure you know, Farah has a, a unique combination of creative thinking and critical thinking. So there's never really been a measure, which is you know, where you know, I focus my time in terms of kind of developing that patent on that measure. So the human skills is the driver. And I think as we go more into a world where we don't know, you know uh, there's a Dell technology study that says, of the jobs of 2030, we don't know what they are. I mean, and you just have to look at the emerging jobs, right? The, 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 the 133 million over the next two years, we don't know what the hard skills are. So do I go learn Python or do I go learn if I'm in tech or do I go learn to know those things? But I pretty much know as a human coming to the table, I might need to communicate, collaborate, critical thinking. I need some emotional IQ. So those are the given. That's the thread. That's the given. Um, so let's focus on those areas. And that's why I focus on those areas, Farah. 
it's amazing what you've been um what you've designed with Gleeka. you know i'm in awe of how you've kind of created this incredible system through ai to actually measure these uh these skills so you've you've talked a little bit about the world economic forum um and just to add there that you know they they rank skills these soft skills such as creativity and critical thinking as number two and three for the top skills that employees will need to thrive in the fourth industrial revolution hey you we hope you're enjoying today's episode We're on a serious mission here to create one of the world's best podcast series and we'd be so grateful if you could support us in any way by becoming a patron of the show. There's a tier to suit every level, from early bird tiers where you get downloads to all my music with some super cool ninja stickers, to our VIP mission maker tiers where you get epic rewards like exclusive footage that never gets aired, the chance to submit questions to our guests with signed copies of books from them, DJ lessons, one-to-one coaching, and a whole load of super cool Ninja and Mission Maker merchandise. You can start supporting us for less than what it costs you to fill up your car for a month by simply heading over to www.patreon.com forward slash mission makers. Thanks for listening, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the show. So why do you think that companies cut budgets towards developing these skills is it because they can't there hasn't been that measurement you know very direct measurement in place um but when in fact these are the ones that they struggle the most with in terms of their you know their employees and developing this culture um amongst their amongst their teams so i think measure is one facet of it the second part of it is uh if you look out there there are not a lot of people teaching it really well so it's not like hard skills learning, uh, you know, in terms of the human skills where you go in and it's memory work. So, you know, think about it, right? If I'm going to learn um, uh, uh, digital marketing, I go in, I can take a weekend course or a course on Udemy, I get some right or wrong answers and I, it's um, human skills, it's the application. So it requires, there are three things required for human skills to actually learn it um, and measure it. Um, And it is, you have to come to it often, the degree of difficulty of application changes, and you must have a feedback loop. It requires way greater effort. So I think for corporates, um, the lack of measure means they can't tie it to an item in their, you know, balance sheet or their, you know, in terms of their statement, right? So number one, there's that aspect. I can't measure it. Like, uh, do you have an A in critical thinking or creativity? Like, how do I measure that in terms of your KPIs? And then number two, well, why is it that you just can't go to a weekend leadership in a weekend um, course in leadership and become a leader? Um, and it doesn't work that way either, right? So there is this idea of how do you make it habit and practice? It requires greater investment. So I think the combination of the both, uh, um, it's a harder nut to crack. Um, and, and certainly it's not low hanging fruit. Um, and I think that's why corporates have a hard time with it. Compassion is very important in leadership. And yet many leaders struggle with actually developing this. And sometimes their workplaces become places of cyberbullying and they don't have very positive uh, environments. What do you think is one of the first things a leader should do to to cultivate a culture of compassion? Wow. Um, So one as a leader, um, you're not always, you know, you have to also be forgiving on yourself that you're not always going to be the most compassionate leader. I think, um, and I think if you start from that place of everyone is entitled to have a bad day, even including you, and you create a workplace that is vulnerable enough to allow people to raise their hands and be able to say that, um, uh, you know, that's a start in terms of a compassionate Um, You know, so often, I think, um, not being able to just recognize that we're humans, and we're going to walk in with all kinds, each of us have all kinds of baggage, and all kinds of emotions. And, um, uh, you know, I have days where I actually say to my team, I'm really having a bad day, it's not a great day to talk to me. And they will, you know, they send me chocolates or they send me like, you know, just virtual stuff. And they're like, okay, we're not talking to her today. Like it's not happening today, but I need to be able to do that uh, with my team. I have a fairly young team because then I give them permission themselves to also do that. And I think part of that compassionate leader is giving us space to just be right. Um, to, To not leave any parts of ourselves at the door. And if you allow people to walk in with their full selves, it's going to be messy. It's not going to be perfect. 
people are gonna have bad days um and that's all the that's the beauty of being human and be very kind of forgiving with each other so always start from a place you know one of the things i often tell them is start from a place if someone is upsetting you and if something doesn't feel right ask a question from a place of curiosity versus blame so instead of going, you know, um, that was really terrible. I think da da da, and you start kind of coming down on someone from a place of curiosity. I wonder what you was you were thinking when you did, you know, whatever. And curiosity then allows that person to exhale and not be defensive, and that's a great act of compassion. So coming from a place of curiosity, I think also coming from a place of vulnerability and showing that you know you need compassion also. So. I can tell you as a leader, I have recently said to my team, why is it that nobody ever asked me if I'm having a good day? And they were kind of taken back by that. And I said, because, you know, it shouldn't be that I have to come to stand up every single day, making sure everyone is okay. I said, maybe I would love if someone checks in on me during the day and go, how are you doing? Are you having a great day? Is everything okay? Um, um, so I think also being vulnerable as a leader and also um, showing what you need and asking for what you need, even if it's from a place, a vulnerable place, I think it's very important and an act of, uh, for them uh, of compassion. And um, the third part is, um, as I said to you, leaving them the room to be able to just be who they are, right? Um, you know, and, and, and voice up and speak up when you need space and room and not leave parts of themselves at the door. So that would be the three things I would say to you, Farah, in terms of mm -hmm. compassion as a leader. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. That's so profound. And yeah, it's amazing how so many people just don't ask, you know, how are you when you ask them that question back? I think it's, you know, it's it should just, you should always ask that question back. It's, you, you're having, it's a two-way relationship and both people have invested a lot of time and energy to be in that space. And it has yeah. to be held with the, with the same level of care and respect. Um, and also something that you said there that we were having a chat about earlier about, you know, taking the space away and sometimes some of the hardest things as a founder of a startup is like you know you're developing this culture this dna in your organization that reflects you and there's so much when you're a founder that you have to be in so many different areas so many different hats and you know you just you it, it's what you sort of said to me earlier about just letting go and like letting your team take over that and and just and kind of just detaching yourself from the process but yet your spirit is still embodied through how they you know communicate how they deliver the customer experience whatever whatever it is as as the youngest ever global digital manager at dior and, for, and as nikita said for 30 under 30 earlier um how do you how did you ensure that you're always taken quite seriously in business uh, at such a young age particularly so i think um i i was learning from my mistakes or when i say mistakes well, i would say the industry-led mistakes well what i mean by this is when I was first, um, my story when I was in Estee Lauder companies, I started as an intern unpaid. And then two months in, I became the youngest ever manager because that social media role came available and I was able to sell myself internally, be like, hang on, I have my own following on social media. I know how to do all this stuff. Let me transfer that to a brand. And at that time, it was quite a new role in the industry in general uh, a couple of years ago, five, six years ago. But now um, I remember my first time I signed the contract, the first thing someone said to me was like, you're way too young to be a manager. This is ridiculous. This company's a joke. Like to my face. And I was like, oh, that was my first like entry into politics in the company. And I was so naive to that. You know, never understood that. I was trained in engineering. You know, we're like coders. And suddenly I'm in this kind of corporate world. Um, and I didn't speak up for myself. I let be, I let myself be sort of corporately bullied sometimes. And and sometimes, you know, it was an up and up and down. Like there were days where I was treated really well, but then days where I was like, this is super unfair because this is not about my work. This is about something I can't control, like my age. Um, and I started to realize that age, and I started believing it, but I was like, no, but age is, is not experience dependent. Like having, you know, two years or, and not even that experience is not expertise dependent. So like having two years of experience, I might have a faster rate of absorption of learning or different experiences within those years than someone who's been in the job for 10 years. And at 26 or 25 or 24, doesn't mean that that age means that my rate of learning must be younger because I'm because I'm I am of a younger age. So I started to realize I need to speak up for what I think is right. And I said when I saw my first job at Dior, my, 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 my first day at Dior, sorry, I said, if my age is mentioned in a meeting that's not related to the quality of work, but just as a kind of a 
stopping point or like a political point, I quit. And I put that from day one on the table as a sort of protective mechanism that I have a sort of duty to stand by that. And of course it happened, but then every time it happened, I went to my CEO and said, mm -mm, this is not happening, this is not happening. And I actually managed to progress so much in my career. And by the end of it, 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 yes, I had to motivate myself a little bit more to showcase my work to others and say, look, okay, you might have some doubts, fair enough. I'm 20, 25 at the time and I'm managing a team of people who are older than me, but look at the work. So I went a step further to demonstrate my work is of top quality, but I also wasn't afraid to speak up and protect myself, not just for me, but for the people yet to come, because there are many young, um, when I say young, it's a spectrum, right? But there are many young entrepreneurs in their career that have the capacity to still deliver um, but not be, I don't want them to be jailed by this kind of corporate hierarchical, oh, wait three years till you ask for a bonus, wait five years till we get promotion, because why are we living in a society that accepts a uh, copy and paste approach and not individualistic, you know, analysis? Yeah, definitely. Well, there's so much in there that um, I, I really resonate with. And at the end of the day, I really believe that, you know, on the one hand, yes, you know, obviously um, your experience is, is one thing, but really a true leader the, the, is about the soft skills that they have. Um, and that is what sets them apart in how they manage teams and and everything else. Um, so it's really important. And, and it doesn't matter how old you are, you know, those you're not going to be more compassionate by the age of X than you are, you know, Y is completely down to your, who you are as a person. Um, but it's amazing that you had the courage to stand up and like you say, pave the way for others, which is obviously so, so, so important. Kind of talking a little bit about conscious capital and, and legacy brands. Do you guys feel like they should be doing more when they have such, you know, power and they have had the keys to influence such a huge critical mass? And why do you think, that it takes such a long time to implement these sustainable initiatives? Is it because they're just too big? Um, what What are your guys' kind of opinions on this? So I have a quite a few opinions because I've, I've worked in big big companies. And actually one of the reasons why I leave these big I left these big companies is because of this factor, right? Yeah. Um, most of the time there's a three-pronged approach. One is the, the, the most obvious is actually they're not built to ever be these kind of brands because they didn't start with a mission. You have these heritage brands that came from heritage, but they didn't actually have the root, the, 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 the owner didn't necessarily create them for a purpose of giving back. And it's quite difficult sometimes for brands to diversify into that without seeing so marketing led, right? It, it doesn't come from the root of the brand. Um, so that's one thing. And I think that's why new brands today are really exciting because they really do have at the heart um, an authentic, authentic story and a reason and a why. Not all, some are about, you know, made just for profit, but the ones that we really connect with today are those kind of brands. That's, that's why we're all interested in these kind of new Sephora-led brands and the, the giants and the makeup and beauty industry that are like, all right, Mac, I've, I've had this product for ages, but don't really connect to it anymore. There's no one I connect with. The second thing I would say is to do with the fact that it's to do with the leadership team and the, and the in-house team. We forget that these brands are actually not the brand that people behind it, you know, they're like 20 people, 30 people, 40 people in this room. And if none of them really are leading the conversation, then honestly, you don't really generally have um, that catalyst to change. And then the third thing I think is because they're scared. Um, they're scared of, um, you know, if they turn on that button, then they have to actually commit to it. They've got to be, you know, they're especially if a band has got a huge brand presence, it's not a light word. And the minute you say, you know, we're going sustainable, you'll have a lot of questions asked at you. So I think it's about, I understand, but I think if you really want to be the change we want to see, we've got to, to com combat that. We've got to be creative in ways to, to, to move forward. We've got to be um, hiring the right international and you know, even younger uh, people internally to have this um, kind of voice and to be listened to. And third, we've got to be fearless. We have to be now not worried about what could be, what could be, and just do it because we need to now start really making a difference in the world. Whether you're a beauty brand, you're a race driver, whatever it is, you've got to now think about the planet as well. Yeah, definitely. It's not, it's not an option. And I think you're so right in the fact that like in the past brands, you know, they, they did what they did and then they dealt with the problems later. Whereas now we're like, okay, this is the problem and let's root our entire mission around how to navigate around these problems and not create further problems for the you know future generations. Talking about um, the female quotient, what, what role does branding play in sort of empowering the mission behind 
what you're doing? Well, the name really came, you know, because we always hear about the intelligence quotient, IQ. Then we start talking about the emotional quotient, EQ. Now we talk about the female quotient, FQ. When you add more women to any equation, there's a return on equity. And so this is really what we're all about, advancing all women and closing the equity gaps. Um, and it, it's not that hard. And especially when you just put it out there. And, and we all see, I mean, there's a 30% threshold rule. At the 30% level, that's when we transform culture. And so if you truly want to feel comfortable in the environment, you have to be able to not only have representation, but you need to have reflection. You need to feel like there's a lot of people like you, not everyone, but you need to, to, to feel comfortable that there are others that are like you inside of an organization. That's when culture happens. And so it's not about leadership from top down. Culture is something that is shared with values of the, the people that make up a culture. People make up a culture. A brick wall is not culture. The name of a company is not a culture. It is the heart and soul of the people inside that all come together and play as a team, you know, a value add collective team. And that leads me quite nicely to my next question, which we, we sort of talked about earlier, but but now knowing that sort of 99% of your, your company is, is, uh, is female led, what in this sort of crisis, what have you seen? What, what, are the, what do you think are some of the key things that have sh- stood out to you about the power of feminine leadership and how that might be helping um, sort of transform or transcend, let's say this, uh, this time? Yeah, that's a really good question. Well, we see the countries that are um, actually the most proactive with COVID that have um, done the best are countries run by women. And so if you think about the feminine qualities, compassion, empathy, passion, resilience, nurturing, those are qualities that are caregiving qualities. And caregiving is still by default predominantly women, for the most part. When men are primary caregivers, they will have the same challenges. But those are the greatest qualities of leadership today. And those are qualities of caregiving. And yet we're losing our best leaders to caregiving. So what we are finding, if you actually Google now best qualities of leadership, you will see empathy coming up as one, empathy and compassion as top 10. I don't think we've ever seen that before. So we need to make those invisible skills quite visible. Those are the soft skills that are hard to quantify. And yet, because they're not measurable, they're not the the masculine, decisive, linear, aggressive, analytic. They are the soft skills. And so how do we quantify the value of soft skills and hold people accountable for those skills? And by the way, even start interviewing with those skills in mind. I'd love to see a job description. We're looking for an empathetic, charismatic, collaborative, visionary leader that can deliver a great ROI. How about that? Pick me. I'll take that any day. So these are the kinds of things that we're working on to create a shift in expectation and also to create measurement for accountability and to hold everyone in an organization responsible for creating the culture that they want to belong to. Absolutely. And I think this time has really, you know, enlightened people as to why most C-suite leaders value those soft skills more than any of the hard skills that we can develop, because that's that's what will carry us through and, and allow us to survive and thrive, you know, particularly in, in this in, in this moment. You, you famously spoke about wanting to break the rules of corporate America in a, in a TED talk to rewrite the rules of the workplace. Uh, what w- are, were some of those first three rules that you wanted to break? And do you believe that we have to master the rules first in order to break them? No, I think when you master them, they're harder to break. I, I think that it's not even about undoing. You know, people talk about rewriting history. We cannot rewrite history. History happened, but we can pick it up now and move forward and not necessarily, you know, legacy runs faster than reality. So if we keep repeating history, then nothing is going to change. I mean, you know, the Albert Einstein, the same perspective that, you know, got you there is the same one that's going to get you out unless you bring different perspective to the table. So I think that, you know, this is a perfect moment to not even break the rules, but to write the new ones forward, you know, write forward and they might not all be right, but they will be new and evolved. 
And so I think that that's the only way you get out of status quo land and, and not to get out for, to get out sake, to get out because it's necessary, because what we've been doing has not been working. If it's been working, don't break it to break it. You know, being a troublemaker is, is not fun. You know, someone called me the good troublemaker. So I felt like I was the good witch instead of the bad witch, but the rules are just, you know, rules that were written over a hundred years ago by men for, you know, for men when women just weren't in the workplace. And we're just playing catch up, but we're never going to catch up. The only way we'll catch up is to close the door of inequity, open the new door of opportunity and move forward with positivity and proactivity. Thank you guys for listening. Season three will be back with a bang in the autumn. Until then, we've got plenty of impactful bonus and bite-sized episodes coming your way. So don't forget to subscribe and share the show with your friends because it truly means the world to us. And if you're interested in some super cool rewards like virtual DJ lessons with me, signed books from our guests and exclusive merchandise, then head over to www.patreon.com forward slash mission makers to check out how you can start supporting the show for less than what it costs you to fill up your car. So till then, mission makers, be safe, be healthy and be laser focused. (music) 